Today we have one of the rarest opportunities to see two legends. Actually, I think the biggest scholars in the Bible study world. We managed to bring them together to talk about the most important topics of the Bible. Guys, just come with me and we will start. Welcome, uh, Israel Knoll. Israel Knoll is professor of uh, Hebrew Bible here at the Hebrew University of uh, Jerusalem. He has uh, worked on a broad range of topics and he's but particularly well known uh, for his work on the Pentateuch. And uh, Israel Knoll, I would like to ask you uh, first a very general question. Who wrote the Pentateuch? For answering the question, I will introduce you, Professor Konrad Smith of Zurich University, also wrote on many subjects, but related to our work is his book about uh, the tradition in Genesis, which is separated from the tradition in the uh, following uh, books. A very interesting suggestion, which I, I really respect very much. In my recent book, I refer to wow. it, and uh, so who wrote the who wrote the the Torah? A very good question. Uh, I can't answer the question to tell you the truth, but I would say about something about writing of the Torah, namely the issue of writing. Uh, if we look at the book of Torah, we can see that we have in the Torah mainly stories and laws, and also uh, small portions of poetry, like uh, the Song on the Sea in uh, Numbers, in uh, Exodus 15, uh, the Song of Moses, uh, Deuteronomy uh, 32, the Blessing of Moses, Deuteronomy 33. And so uh, uh, maybe the question of writing should be treated separately for each of uh, uh, these uh, genres. Namely, poems could exist from the very ancient period because they were transmitted orally. Uh, you know, cultures uh, can have a very minimal knowledge of reading of, uh, uh, and writing and still create very sophisticated poetry. We see it with the old Arabs. They, uh, before the time of Muhammad, uh, what they call the time of Jahliya, the ignorance, um, the level of uh, knowledge of reading of, of literacy was, was very low. Still, they had a beautiful poetry uh, who was transmitted orally. So, you know, uh, the Song of the Sea or the Trinity 33 can go back to early period before the time that literacy uh, was very much in existence in ancient Israel. So this is for the poems. With regard to the stories of the Torah, I do believe that you have to wait. You have to wait that uh, in the society there will be a sufficient level of literacy before you write and publish stories. When you don't have enough people in the society who will know how to read the story, um, I don't think that we can imagine writing of, this, of stories. So for this reason, I would say that we have to wait till the 8th century BCE uh, when we know from archaeology that literacy was more common 
First, in the northern kingdom, Israel, uh, we have uh, uh, from Samaria evidence of reading and writing. Later on, in the uh, later part of the 8th century BC, time of Hezekiah, we have the famous Siloam uh, inscription and also uh, Lamelech uh, Bule. Uh, so this is the time that we have to expect stories to be written, the same as with classical prophecy. Before the 8th century, we don't have written prophecies. Elijah, Elisha, they were very prominent prophets. We don't have a single prophecy written which was composed by them. Why? Probably because in the 9th century, they didn't have yet the, the needed level of literacy in ancient Israel. Uh, but in the 8th century, we have first in the Northern Kingdom, Amos and Hosea, and then in Judah, we have uh, Isaiah and Micah. These are the first four prophets that uh, their prophecies were written in a book. So. This is the time of the big change, 8th century BC. And uh, according to your opinion, which would be the, the latest, the youngest texts in the Torah? The youngest. The youngest ones, yeah. I, you have uh, invited me uh, kindly to a conference in Zurich <laughs> some years ago, and then I spoke about the final editing of the Torah, which in my view was uh, done by a priestly popular school, maybe I will explain the term later, which is, uh, I call it the holiness school. And I think that they were the editors, they worked in the Persian period, so there is some impact of Persian names and words in their work, and they were the final editors uh, of the book of the Torah. And when it was finished, Ezra brought it uh, to Jerusalem. Yeah. What kind of uh, Persian words are you thinking? The famous Michna Saim, the pants? Uh, yes, the, uh, the uh, Mishcha in the term of a measurement, mm -hmm. uh, the name Parnas, mm -hmm. uh, etc., things mm -hmm. like this. And how do you explain the big differences in the tabernacle account, Exodus 35 to 40, where you have big differences in the Septuagint? So would you say there could also be some uh, activity going on in the Hellenistic period in the formation of the Torah? This is very, it is very interesting that you're asking me this question now, because last Wednesday, you spoke in the Hebrew University, a uh, very nice lecture, and uh, for the uh, uh, our department. And before you started to speak, I had a talk with the Iman Professor Emmanuel Tov exactly okay. <laughs> about this subject. The two of us we we dealt with this question some years ago, mm -hmm. and we thought about writing together something. Uh -huh. And he just informed me that Nathan McDonald of Cambridge University is finishing a book about it. And uh, the, the big question is, uh, is it a, an evidence for a different uh, version of the, uh, Hebrew version of these chapters, or is it some kind of a midrash? So uh, Tov and McDonald has different yes. views about it. Yeah. And regarding the composition of the Torah, do you still adhere to the classical documentary hypothesis with the assumption of the four uh, sources, or would you propose some amendments to this I, uh, traditional theory? I think that uh, with regard to the priestly school, I still there, and also with the difference between uh, the, the priestly document and the later holiness school. Um, with regard to the Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomy, nobody argues 
about uh, the uniqueness of Deuteronomy. Uh, with regard to the non-priestly elements of the, of, uh, of the Torah, uh, the four first books, uh, which were used to call J and E, I'm uh, more open to variations. For instance, and here I come uh, close to your book, which I've mentioned, and I would like to hear more about it later. But uh, in my view, uh, the story, I will give an example. The story about Bethel as the local place of revelation, the place where is the gate of uh, heaven, etc., etc., uh, which is traditionally related, at least uh, uh, some part of it, to the e source, the northern e source, uh, does not go so well, in my view, with the rejection of the cult of Betel, namely the golden. Uh, the golden it, calf, yeah. Yes, it's. I think not so clear how person can talk on one hand uh, so enthusiastically about the holiness of yeah. Bethel, and then in the book of Exodus to attack uh, the golden calf in such a strong way. So possibly we have to forget about e source in this case and say there are various traditions in the Northern Kingdom and not uh, definitely uh, e source. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please tell me more about your theory about the difference between uh, Genesis and the following books. Yeah, I think uh, you already mentioned that actually no one uh, disputes that uh, Deuteronomy is something on its own. And I think the same is to a certain extent also true for Genesis. I think Genesis is really something which is different from the other four or say three uh, following books. And I think this is uh, quite obvious if you just look at How the would you, I agree with you, but I, how would you define the difference yeah. between Genesis and the other books? Yeah, so I think Exodus through Deuteronomy actually is held together uh, by the bio biography of Moses. And I think this is also the reason why all the legal material is integrated into Exodus through Deuteronomy. But I think there are also very important conceptual and theological differences between Exodus and the following books on the one hand and Genesis on the other hand. In Exodus uh, to uh, Deuteronomy, you actually have a quite intolerant monolatry as the main vision of God. So you shall not have any other gods beside me. You shall not make peace or make a covenant with the uh, inhabitants of the land. Whereas in Genesis, somehow it's much more inclusive. So there are different designations and terms for uh, God, El Bet El, El Roi, uh, or Elohim as a very general term, El Shaddai, and so on. And also the patriarchs, the ancestors, they somehow have a lot of interactions with the representatives uh, in the land. And Genesis apparently seems to argue uh, for an origin tradition of Israel that originates in the land itself. So the ancestors are there and they get the promise of the land, whereas in Exodus and the, the other books, it's really, it's, you, have a, you have a different picture there. Israel is Israel from Egypt on and Israel is being elected by God and led out of Egypt and then somehow uh, takes into possession the land. And, and, and I think it's really, if, uh, in my book, that you kindly mentioned Genesis and the Moses story, I simply looked at all the connections, the explicit to a certain degree, also the implicit connections between Genesis on the one hand and the Exodus Moses story on and the other hand. And uh, you can see it's actually, it's, it's not very tightly bound together. So the, the most prominent bridge between 
Genesis and Exodus is the Joseph story. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the Joseph story, of course, it explains now how Israel came to Egypt mm -hmm. in order uh, then to move out of mm -hmm. Egypt again. Mm -hmm. But the vision of Egypt and the vision of Pharaoh is so different in Joseph, yes. in Joseph's story yes. and in Exodus on the other hand, yes. that I was not convinced that this is mm. a storyline that is very old. In the Joseph story, Pharaoh is a wise ruler and he appoints Joseph the second person in the state. And Israel, they are nomads and they are, yeah, they are dwelling in Egypt, in Goshen, and whereas in Exodus you have a tyrant uh, as Pharaoh uh, and uh, he doesn't know anything about uh, Joseph as Exodus 1.8 uh, explains. And the, the Israelites look more like uh, prisoners of war and they have to do corvée. Uh, labor. So my impression here was really that apparently Genesis on the one hand and Exodus on the other hand, they were formerly independent traditions. And also if you look in the Psalms or in the Book of Prophets, you can see that uh, some of the combination of these uh, two traditions in one sequence also uh, would uh, only be uh, be seen in texts that are uh, late. quite late. So uh, my impression was, uh, other than the traditional documentary hypothesis, which claimed uh, J, E uh, and P, they all uh, told the same story and J and E belong to the say 9th or 8th century BC. I think uh, for me it was simply more plausible to assume that Genesis and Exodus, the Moses story, these are the main uh, constituents of the story of the Torah. And I could find a clear, a clear link between these traditions actually only as late as P uh, that I'm dating to the late 6th uh, century. I found it interesting that even somehow in the story about the commissioning of Moses in Exodus 6, you still have this difference that God in Exodus 6, it's an undisputed P text. He says, uh, I made myself known to the patriarchs mm. as El Shaddai, mm. but my name is Adonai. Uh, so that you can see apparently still for P, there was a certain divergence in, mm. Uh, mm. in, in, uh, uh, in these conceptions of God. But maybe this would be also uh, a, a good moment to hear or to discuss with you uh, the date of P. Where do you actually situate okay. P? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I just read an article today, which I was pleased with. It just came out by Igor Bloch, uh, who is an uh, expert in linguistics and he's, uh, he works in the uh, Museum of uh, the Bible Lands here in Jerusalem. And he wrote about uh, the two words, uh, Dror and, Ez and Ezrach. And he suggested that we can only understand the function in, in, the, uh, in the Torah, in the Holiness Code, as being related to Assyrian occupation. Not the Babylonian occupation, but the Assyrian occupation. And uh, I wrote him, this goes very well <laughs> with my suggestion in my book, The Sanctuary of Silence, that the, the, uh, the Holiness Code was, was composed uh, um, in the time of uh, Ahaz and Hezekiah, which were under, most of the time, under Assyrian, not direct uh, occupation, but Ahaz became a vassal of, of, the, of the king of Assyria. So, so I, I was pleased to see it, and I'm still uh, keeping my mind on it, that, that the Holiness Code, the beginning of age, is in that period. Later on, as I said before, uh, uh, editors from the Holiness Code uh, continued to work uh, in Babylon, uh, Babylonian period, in the Persian period, and they were later the editors of the Torah. P, this was my main innovation in my book, which was at the time very well accepted, that P, unlike what people thought before, 
is L is an H. So I have to put P uh, generally before uh, the, the time of Hezekiah. Yeah. And how this goes with what I said before about literacy and, and knowledge of reading and writing. I think that uh, even though literacy uh, was not uh, uh, very common uh, among the this, this simple people, we have always to imagine, like in the other culture of the ancient Near East, that in the centers of government and religion, there were few experts who knew how to read and write even before knowledge of reading and writing was common in the people. So at least the, the legal documents of P, the Torot, uh, the priestly Torah, this was a very important uh, article by, what was his name? He was uh, son of law of Gunkel. Uh, it's very technical. You can you can see it's a it's a small scroll with an introduction line of introduction. Yeah, I think you mean Begrich, yeah. Begrich, yeah. That, that's true. Begrich, yes. Uh, um, um, and at the end, you have. Many times a summary again, Zotorata Metzora, Zotorata Yoledet, etc., etc. And I can imagine the ancient priest goes with a bag full of scrolls and he pick up a scroll and uh, look, and, and the title is written. He, he doesn't have he, he doesn't have to unroll the scroll because you have you know. This is for Tech, yeah. this is for Khatat. This is for a woman who gave birth. This is very technical, mm -hmm. very technical. Yeah. We've mentioned in the conversation before um, uh, Michael Fishman, and he wrote about uh, this, and it was compared by several scholars to Hittite, Horite documents, legal documents, which also have the same frame. Also in terms of the rituals, the best example, and this is agreed by many scholars who are special in, 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 in Israeli cult, the best similarities are in the Hittite Horite tradition. There's a, it is in yeah. Hittite, Anatolia, but they said this is from Kisuvatna, which is yeah. the borderline between, yeah. between the uh, Hittites and the Horite who lived uh, uh, more uh, to the area of Haran. Yeah. Uh, purification with blood purification of the house, uh, purification of the woman who gave birth, a uh, lot and lot and lot of similarities. And this culture, the Hittite Empire, disappeared in the transition of the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, around 1200 BCE. So the traditions are very old, and probably, in my view, we should imagine that they were transmitted to early Israel, to ancient Israel, in old times. I, there are several options, but this is yeah. old stuff. What yeah. I would like to say, this is old stuff. It's not, you know, something that you can compare to a Sarachadon. Yeah. This, is not, this is not the family. The family is Hittite, Horite rituals, which are known from before the 12th century. So in my view, 
the Israelite priest learned about it, copied it, reworked it according to their, I, don't know, I wouldn't say monotheistic, but <laughs> more, uh, I would say, uh, monolatrian uh, 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 thinking. And this is what we have at the basis of P. Yeah. I wouldn't make the claim about all of P, but okay. the Torot. Okay. Yes. So the yeah. Torot for yeah. me yeah. are very old. Yeah. I think this is probably something where also many continental European Bible scholars who usually uh, date P to a later period would agree that they say no one just somehow invented all these Torot, but this is traditional uh, material, or as you put it nicely, old stuff. So it's really, uh, no one invents these uh, kind of texts. But you, uh, you, you just mentioned this point, and here I would be interested to learn a bit more how you, how you put that. Because somehow if we go or look at the narrative parts of P, so Genesis 1, the creation account, this is unanimously attributed to P, but it's clearly a monotheistic text. So there is just one deity, it's the creator God, he creates uh, the world, you have a clear separation between God on the one hand and the world on the other hand. So uh, Genesis 1 is modeled upon Enuma Elish, the Babylonian uh, creation myth, which was very popular in the first millennium BCE. But unlike in Enuma Elish, the gods, they after they created the world, they don't move into the creation. But uh, the biblical God really reminds uh, outside of creation, he speaks out of the off. And if we ask about uh, the possible historical location of such a text within the religious history or the intellectual history of ancient Israel, where would you put that? Here I, I change my, my view. Here I change my view. Because uh, in my book I claim that also the the uh, the stories the uh, the prose of P is very early, but now I I open to see a, a difference. Uh, this is also connected to the issue of literacy. A difference between the legal material, the ancient Torah, and the stories. And I'm much more open to see Genesis one. Uh, coming for the time of the Babylonian period. So, okay. so I, I would like to say uh, there can be a difference in time between the laws yeah. and the narrative. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think this is, sounds, sounds for, for me very reasonable. Let's quickly look at the delineation of the Torah. So if you start reading in Genesis, you actually can continue until 2 Kings. It's more or less a continuous storyline, but nevertheless, we know the Torah as an entity unto itself that has a little bit uh, a, a narrative arc that is astonishing. So it uh, starts with the creation of the world, and it ends with the people of Israel somewhere in the sand of the desert of Moab uh, before entering Crossing the, the Jordan, yeah. yes. Why, why was the Torah... Apparently, the Torah is a part of a larger story. Why did... For what reasons? Or, and, and when did someone uh, constitute the Pentateuch as Torah? Uh, in my forthcoming book, I work on the Sinai tradition, uh, their development from the uh, ancient poems, uh, like the Song of Deborah, Deuteronomy 33 and others, uh, to the story, to the Sinai story uh, in the Torah. And one of the major differences that I see is the uh, um, place of Moses or the role of Moses. In the ancient poems, Moses is not that important right, figure. Right. He's mentioned once in, yeah. 
in uh, Psalm uh, uh, 77 uh, about the crossing of the of the sea with 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 uh, Moses and Aaron, but he has no is not a great actor. Uh, the making of Moses as the main actor is, in my view, uh, a result of the narrative of the Torah. And for several reasons, mm -hmm. which I would like to explore in my new book. Uh -huh. So everything in the Torah must, I mean, not Genesis, right. but, but from the birth of Moses, yeah. the story must be connected to the figure of Moses. So when Moses dies, this is the end of the first part of, uh, of the story. Uh, Hexatuch, namely six books combining with Joshua, is a fantasy of German scholars. I don't buy it. I don't either, yeah. I don't either. <laughs> but what do you think about this theory of the Persian imperial authorization of the Torah? That somehow the, yeah, in the, in the Persian Empire, that the Jews were asked, what are the laws that you would like to according uh, to live according to? And then they presented the Torah, because the Persian Empire didn't have a, a, a central imperial law, but they had this well, uh, decentralized I, 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 I system. I think that the, the, the final status of the Torah, uh, which, as I said before, was edited in the Persian period, and was brought by Ezra to Jerusalem was connected uh, also to the status, the legal status of Ezra as the official scribe uh, with the permission from the Persian government. So the force of the Torah in Jerusalem, I think, uh, when it was published by Ezra in Jerusalem, uh, was very much connected um, to the role of the uh, Persian Empire, the interest of the Persian period in, in the religious life of the Jews. They didn't want to let them uh, a, minimal, a minimal role in the secular government. Zerubbabel was probably killed or exiled, it disappears from the map after a very short time. People were looking for the renewal of the Davidic uh, dynasty. This is not, <laughs> the Persian would say, no, 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 there is only one king, of the Persian king, no role for Davidic right, right. dynasty. So, but the temple, the, the laws, this is, was very, very, significant for them, and they helped Ezra. But I don't think that the place of Moses was created in the Persian period. I think it came with the narrative mm -hmm. in the 8th century. Okay. And if we look at the... Uh, we spoke now about the composition of the Torah as such. We spoke about P and H. If we look at the non-priestly material that is usually identified as J and E, e. What, what do you make out of this? I think that the, uh, there is a, the first level uh, developed in the Northern Kingdom uh, in the 8th century, namely in the last decades of the life of the, of the Northern Kingdom, because in 720, nothing was left there. So I think uh, uh, there was a, or, or one uh, narrator or two narr narrators who worked uh, about in, uh, around 750 uh, at the same time as Hosea. So if we speak, uh, for instance, mm. about rejection of the golden calf, this is a common issue of both of them. Yeah. This is uh, on the background of, uh, of the Northern Kingdom. Deuteronomy continues this line because it's very much dependent on Hosea and the northern traditions uh, of the Torah. Later on, we come uh, to, to Judea, and in my view, 
there were narrators there in around the end of the 7th century, uh, the, the 8th century, the 7th century, what we call J. And I think this, this activity, they, in my view, uh, here I, I follow Dillman, the old <laughs> uh, great scholar, August Dillman, contemporary of Velhausen, who didn't accept many of the Vel Velhausen uh, uh, views, uh, that uh, he came from the north to the south, and Jay absorbed E and uh, uh, but also developed his own tradition, like the Garden of Eden, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you would allow for a distinction between the Genesis material and the Exodus yes. material, yes, and J I, and D. I so will, you I would allow. As I said before, I, I think Bethel is different, yeah. very different yeah. in Genesis, and very different. So I can assume the existence of two different northern storytellers. Of course, Bethel, I mean, could not exist for thousands of years with a negative founding story. I mean, they had a different story. Uh, probably God commanded Moses or Aaron to build the golden calf. I assume, I mean, <laughs> you can't imagine a, a, a temple to have such a negative story about the most sacred symbol. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but where is this story? Censored, went with the Assyrian, uh, to the Assyrian captivity, we don't know. We don't know. And what do you think about, there is a, in, already in the 1920s, there was what uh, was once called the fight over Deuteronomy. So uh, classical scholars like Hölscher in the 1920s claimed Deuteronomy, this is not the document of Josiah's reform but it belongs, so to speak, to the post-monarchic period. Because, for example, uh, the king doesn't really play a role in there. And uh, so, uh, and this has been renewed uh, in, say, the last pen uh, 20 years that some people say, yes, we cannot simply make this link between 2 Kings 22 and Deuteronomy on the one hand, uh, but we now have these new Assyrian vassal treaties and Deuteronomy seems to be modeled upon these vassal treaties. But still others, they say, uh, yeah, uh, the, if somehow Deuteronomy would belong to the era uh, of Josiah, the king must uh, have played a much broader role and they say, Deuteronomy is actually a republican document. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you look uh, uh, how it uh, organizes the polity. So, uh, what do I, you I think just about uh, gave you uh, uh, my, my new book, uh, which, uh, I mean, the Hebrew version came out three years ago, but the English version just came out uh, uh, about the Messiah confrontation. Uh, and in this book, I, I, I claim that there were two different traditions within the Hebrew Bible about the king. One is very positive, and it starts with yeah. Isaiah, yeah. Jeremiah, etc., and the messianic expectation. On the other hand, there is the very negative, which is Hosea and the northern narrators, very negative. Hosea is very negative about kingship in general. Uh, so I see the location of D as uh, coming out from a very complicated situation. On the one way, they are the highest of the northern tradition, following Martinot and others. Uh, uh, who pointed out uh, the importance of uh, uh, Mount Gerizim and yeah. Eval uh, in Deuteronomy. Probably the origins of Deuteronomy are in the north. This is why there are so many points of contact between Deuteronomy and stories, northern stories in the 
uh, former books of the of the Pentateuch and also Hosea. Um, uh, but reality is reality. They were refugees who came from the north and sat in Jerusalem and worked in the court of the king. So they cannot say like Hosea, ah, all this idea of king is idolatry. The only leader of Israel should be God, like what was said in the time of Samuel. Kingship is, is a sin. I mean, they <laughs> Josiah will throw them away. So some kind of a compromise is this puppet king that we have in Deuteronomy 18. Yeah, this yeah. is how yeah, I yeah. explain it yeah, in, yeah. in, in, in yeah, my yeah. book. Yeah. But somehow if you uh, make these northern origins of Deuteronomy uh, so strong, would you then say that this, uh, the main claim of Deuteronomy in Deuteronomy 12 to centralize the cult, that somehow the Samaritan reading is correct, that this was not pertaining to Jerusalem from the very beginning? Or would you say it, this is really a Judahite perspective? I the think that uh, uh, it was written, here I follow the Veta and the, the classical scholarship, it was written in Jerusalem, Jerusalem was in their mind, but Jerusalem is not very much mentioned in the book. Uh, we don't have the word Jerusalem in Genesis. So how, why would, you know, in the time when the Torah is proposed to be written, Jerusalem was a foreign Jebusite city with no real deep traditions in the time of the patriarchs. It's a, some kind of a, of a game, we we'll say. Uh, the place where you uh, would choose, yeah. but yeah. Jerusalem is yeah. in the mind. Yeah. Conrad, how do you see the future of the discussion? Because it seems now that Europe is in one camp about the Torah, <laughs> and Israel and some scholars from the States, uh, maybe also England, are... Uh, in a different, I mean, do you feel that we still can do what we do now <laughs> to speak among, uh, among us with a, uh, with a fruitful uh, conversation or not? Well, because there are some people who are pessimistic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I think uh, you are already mentioning, I think our talk is already somehow the best uh, proof that it's possible. But I indeed think uh, that there is a lot of work to do. In 2012-13, we had a year a research group at the Israel Institute uh, for Advanced Studies uh, about uh, bridging the academic cultures between Europe, Israel and North uh, America. And we were a very diverse group composed out of Americans, Europeans and uh, Israeli scholars. And uh, I think indeed uh, there are different imprints on Pentateuchal scholarship in different parts of the world. Although this is a simplified notion, uh, you have in Israel, in Europe and in North America actually the full spectrum, maybe the emphases are a little different. So. Uh, I, simply because of my origin, I'm Swiss, I come from Switzerland, so I'm mostly acquainted with the uh, continental European scholarship. So my take on uh, somehow interpreting biblical literature from a historical point of view, there are many other possible interpretations of biblical literature, but uh, my take on historical interpretation of the biblical literature is to allow as much methods and <laughs> to take in as much data that we can uh, retrieve from very different uh, fields of possible evidence. So on the one hand, I would say, of course, traditional biblical criticism that is done here and there, uh, maybe somewhat differently, but I think the main principles are uh, 
uh, negotiable. We have the problem that we don't have a Deuteronomy from the 6th century or a priestly code from the 5th century. So we, we need to reconstruct because the Bible just exists in copies of copies of copies and copies. So we, we need to rely and to focus on internal uh, evidence. But I would also say we need to take into account historical linguistics. We also have to take into account the uh, archaeological uh, results, for example, to see the battle texts, to which kind of cultic activities in what uh, periods to, could these texts relate. So I think uh, this is very important. Whereas somehow, uh, for example, the group that identifies itself as neo-documentarians that is present both here in Israel and in North America, they would probably, or they argue, the composition of the Pentateuch is a purely literary problem. And that somehow the division of the sources, it wouldn't change if P would have been written in the Middle Ages and J uh, and E in, in antiquity. And for me, uh, this is an, uh, an approach that I, uh, that I don't agree with. I think uh, whenever you deal with ancient texts, I think you need to bring in as much historical evidence as we, as we can. And uh, so I would say this would be my first point where I think we really should uh, develop the field further and uh, trying to at least somehow get some agreement how we can uh, combine uh, different methodologies. The second point that I find important is uh, let's have the co courage to leave blank spots on our landscape it, with regard to compositional issues. So, for example, uh, we spoke about the Torot uh, in the priestly uh, traditions, uh, or there are also other texts in the Bible uh, that simply are not uh, easy to date, uh, to allocate, because uh, their topic is quite general. And I would say also within the Pentateuch, we have two strata that can be identified on, say, uh, their linguistic registers. So the, B, the P and the D texts are relatively easy to, uh, to identify. Yeah. And I think for me it would be very, very helpful in Pentateuchal studies if we would somehow progress from the more safe to the less safe assumption. And for example, P, the P text would be for me uh, relatively safe, I, I still say relatively, but a relatively safe uh, starting point, whereas the discussion about the text labeled J and E, this is more difficult somehow to, uh, to identify, and there we should also admit it's difficult. And if we uh, finally somehow would, uh, would come to identify whole uh, or big, great narrative structures, I think this is probably the least uh, probable uh, element of, of, of theory that we can achieve. But maybe, and this would be the third and last point, the best thing to make progress is really to talk to each other and not just somehow exchanging articles and say, Professor X here is completely uh, <laughs> off track and uh, here is here you have the truth, yes. but really somehow to try to understand what are the observations, what are uh, the evaluations. And this is something that I also often discussed with uh, uh, Professor Israel Finkelstein. We also need to deal or find a way to deal with conflicting evidence. Mm -hmm. So Israel Finkelstein, for example, says in the Persian period, no scribal activity was in going Jerusalem. on in Jerusalem and Judah. So either you have to date the texts that usually are dated to this period earlier or later or to another place like Babylon, Babylonia, Babylon or, or, or Egypt, which might be the case, but I think here I would adduce a similar op or uh, a, a similar aspect that you mentioned for your P in the eighth century. What do you need for a person to write a biblical text if he has the uh, skills 
it, it's you don't need monumental architecture mm -hmm. or it's a, you need a scroll you need a, mm -hmm. a pen you need you <laughs> need a, a brain and a, and, a, and, a. and the heart <laughs> that is committed to what what this person wants to write very nice thank you Conrad, for for uh, for your answer and i share with you the the wish for uh, a healthy and fruitful discussion uh, uh, like I believe we, the two of us, we had now. I think uh, uh, to keep uh, the field, not, uh, you know, as a yeah. crazy uh, battlefield, yeah. but uh, more sober and uh, uh, open discussion, I think this is... Yeah. the main issue that uh, would uh, keep us as uh, still a group of scholars who deal with the same materials and are willing to listen to different uh, ideas. Yeah. I think this is a great tradition of the machloket in the, <laughs> in the rabbinic literature that that okay, one school say this, the other school say this, and but we still talk one to the other, and uh, we want to learn one from the other. Yes, thank you, Israel. It was really great talking to you, and I agree. So on the one hand, I think uh, scholarship is by definition international. I think whoever somehow is doing work on the Bible, on the Pentateuch uh, internationally uh, needs to be heard if he or she has something to say. And I think also uh, biblical scholarship, like any kind of scholarship, is dialogical in nature. Of course, I just can sit in my study and my chamber and think out things, but I'm probably much more likely to make mistakes uh, as if I talk to someone. And maybe a last thing is what I also find a strength in scholars, uh, if scholars are able to change their minds. So uh, of course it's easy always to find an ad hoc explanation why my former theory from 10 years ago is still correct. Uh, this might calm my soul if I somehow still can stick to my theory, but it's, it doesn't really help uh, somehow the, the, the scholarly uh, progress. And therefore, I, I really like this format and I, I learned a lot. Thanks.